hello everyone. This is Vijay Hibatuman, uh, and I would like to welcome you all for joining uh, joining uh, today's uh, uh, Grand Rounds, uh, which is a COVID-19 update to be presented by Dr. David Mushat and by Dr. Darlene Fusco. Dr. Mushat, uh, as most of you by now uh, become familiar, is the section chief of uh, infectious diseases uh, at Tulane School of uh, Medicine and he is an associate professor of medicine. Dr. Mushat received his medical degree in 1986 from Harvard Medical School. He completed his internal medicine residency training from uh, 1986 to, through 89 at the Harvard affiliated Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston, and then completed an infectious diseases fellowship at Tulane University School of Medicine, uh, 1989 through 1991. During the second year of his ID fellowships, he also earned a master's in public health and uh, tropical medicine at Tulane School of Public Health and Tropical Medicine. Dr. Mushat joined Tulane ID section as faculty immediately following his fellowship. He later became the director of the ID fellowship program and was promoted to be the chief of the section in 2006, the position he currently holds. Uh, he's uh, been the principal uh, investigator of the Louisiana Community AIDS Research Program and uh, the Tulane Clinical Trial Site that was formerly uh, part of the uh, CPCRA and now part of INSIGHT, an NIH-funded international HIV research group that focuses on strategies in HIV treatment at the community level. Dr. Mushat is also a respected uh, teacher uh, enjoys teaching students, residents, and fellows, and has received the best subspecial, subspecialty attending award from the Medicine Residency Program in 2008. Dr. Mushat's uh, main research interest has been uh, with HIV clinical trials, but lately he has been forced to shift his attention <laughs> to the COVID pandemic and uh, that, uh, that's uh, what he will be talking about to us today. He will be followed by Dr. Darlene Fusco, who recently uh, joined the uh, Tulane program. Uh, Dr. Fusco is an assistant professor of medicine and a member of uh, the infectious diseases section at Tulane University School of Medicine. Dr. Fusco earned her MD degree from, uh, from the Albert Einstein College of Medicine in New York. Uh, she did a, a PhD in structural biology in Albert Einstein College of Medicine in New York. Her residency uh, was uh, completed in internal medicine in Mass General Hospital, Boston, uh, Massachusetts, uh, followed by fellowship in infectious diseases and while Cornell Medical College, New York, uh, New York City. <clears throat> the Darlene Fusco joined Tulane uh, University Medical Center in July 2018. Her research focus has been on uh, host factors that mediate the interferon antiviral response uh, distal to viral subversion points using in vitro and in vivo models for dengue and Zika virus. Uh, uh, and uh, she, just like uh, Dr. Mushat, uh, was forced to focus uh, her uh, attention to COVID as well. She is now leading a, uh, a large number of uh, uh, studies uh, and clinical trials on COVID at Tulane. It's uh, my pleasure to turn the uh, podium to Dr. Mushet. It's all yours, uh, Dr. Mushet. I want to remind uh, the participants, uh, I expect there will be some time for questions. Please uh, type your questions in the question, uh, Q&A box at the bottom of your uh, screen, and uh, I'll be happy to read them uh, to the participants uh, uh, at the end of the presentation. Thank you all for joining. Dr. Mushet, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Badman. Great to be here. All right, everybody. So I'm going to talk about um, clinical aspects, including some epidemiology, and then uh, my colleague, Dr. Fusco, will tell you about the landscape of research in COVID at Tulane. So this is the Johns Hopkins dashboard that I recommend everybody take a look at every now and then um, as of uh, yesterday. And it shows that worldwide, there's, uh, almost, there's been almost 15 million um, cases of COVID diagnosed. And, and recently you may have heard that the estimate is that there's probably at least tenfold more people out there that are actually truly infected. Not everybody comes to medical attention. So probably at least 150 million, if not more. 
Um, there's been over half a million deaths attributed to COVID. You can see on the left that the U.S. leads the pack with nearly 4 million cases, and uh, we're approaching 150,000 um, deaths. Uh, this just shows the, the number of cases on a daily basis, and you can see that we had that surge in March and April, a little bit of a lull, and unfortunately now we're on a steep upward uh, bent. Um, no surprises. I think everybody hears about it every day from the media. Um, this is the Louisiana OPH website. It's a nice little um, way to up update yourself on what's going every day in this area. You can see that Louisiana has had almost 100,000 cases reported with nearly 3,500 deaths. Uh, I'm pleased to see that over a million of our citizens have been screened out of a population of about 4.6 million, so that's about 25%. You can see currently with numbers going up, we have uh, over 1,500 people in the hospital with COVID and an increased number of people on ventilators compared to a few weeks ago. Um, every, virtually every parish in the state, as you can see, is in red, which means that the, the daily rates are, are unfortunately going up. Um, as we expected, we, we were surrounded by states such as Texas and others that have had uh, increases in cases for a while. And we knew it was just a matter of time before it, it uh, filtered over into Louisiana. This is um, a table of some data showing just the numbers of cases that we had between the first case at the VA in March, uh, March 9th and, um, and May the 12th. So about a two month span, you can see that uh, between our three um, local teaching hospitals, VA, UMC and TMC, um, um, there were over a thousand people admitted um, with uh, COVID-19, a, a pretty significant number. Um, and of course, quite a few deaths and, and one on the maximum number inpatients was pretty high, 72 at the VA, 185 at UMC, and 66 at Tulane. So this hit us pretty hard um, back in uh, March and April, and things then settled down. But unfortunately, things are starting to pick up again. So just this is the only slide I'm going to show you on the biology of this virus. Um, but I, the reason I show this is that there is a more recently described receptor um, that plays a role. So I think everybody knows that the SARS-CoV-2 has this, so this corona, thus its name, of uh, spike protein or S protein, which is uh, in critical uh, because this is the protein that, that docks with the ACE2 receptors that are found in the airways, kidneys, GI tract, heart, everywhere that you see manifestations of this infection. And then more recently, it's been discovered that there's yet another um, receptor that plays a role. It's the TMPR SS2. It's a serine protease, and what it does is it, um, it actually, interestingly, it activates the S protein by proteolytic cleavage and basically primes the S protein to bind with ACE2. And this is very reminiscent of HIV. Back in the, in the early days, we knew that CD4 was an important receptor, but it took years before we discovered other receptors, such as the chemokine receptors. So I will say the uh, progress is very fast. We've known this you know, for several months now. But at any rate, this poses or presents another potential target for um, therapeutics. So let's talk a little bit about transmission. This has been very much in the news. Uh, I'd like to start out with definitions and, and semantics. I think there's a lot of confusion. In large part, the blame lies with the scientific field for not defining the terms very well and for us using them in, in, in a not a very precise manner. There are essentially two types of particles that we are concerned about. The droplets are the larger particles that come out when we cough or sneeze, and they tend to fall to the ground within six feet, within seconds to minutes. Whereas the aerosols are much smaller. They're generally less than five microns in diameter. They can go more than six feet. They can stay in the air um, based on Chad Roy's data at the Primate Center for perhaps more than 16 hours. So again, droplets um, are larger. They fall to the ground quickly. Now, aerosols, are the ones that stay in the air longer. And there's other terms that are used for that. The other terms are uh, tiny or microscopic droplets and droplet nuclei. Droplet nuclei are essentially the same thing. That's the term we've used for years for TB. Tubercle bacilli float around the air in little tiny aerosols called droplet nuclei. It's basically desiccated aerosols. They can stay in the air for a long, long time. This is essentially the same thing, okay? Obviously in biology, there's, things are always a continuum. And the reality is when we cough or sneeze or talk or sing, we expel droplets and aerosols. So we think that some transmission is through fomites, through surfaces that become contaminated, but that's probably not the dominant mode of transmission. Clearly, the uh, transmission through the air is probably the key mode of, of transmission 
Um, and we think it's mostly the droplets, the larger particles, but there's probably some transmission through aerosols. How much, what, what relative proportion really is unknown. Um, the, you know, the bottom line is that all three pathways uh, play a role with pr droplets probably pay, playing the most important um, role. So let's go to clinical. Um, and this has not changed since I gave grand rounds a few months ago. The, the range is still two to 14 days with rare uh, instances of people incubating over um, 20, 21 days. The median is about four to five days. The symptoms, of course, are classically fever with or without cough, shortness of breath, and then all the flu-like sim symptoms, myalgias, sore throat, headache. More uh, After the initial uh, uh, epidemic, it was then noticed that people were also having GI symptoms such as abdominal pain, nausea, vomit, diarrhea. And then, uh, and then also it was noted that some people do have a loss or reduction in smell and taste which is seen with other viruses, but it's very suggestive of, of this particular virus. And there's gonna be other symptoms, uh, and, and there are other symptoms out there that we are seeing as we get more familiar with this disease. So this is the so-called surveillance pyramid that was first published back, I think in February, based on data from China, and it still pretty much holds up. You, you, all viruses, whether they be arboviruses or uh, other um, infections for that matter, generally have a pyramid where, you know, the vast majority of cases, not always, but usually are not diagnosed. And then you have a smaller number that come to clinical attention. And so for this disease, it would appear that roughly 80% of people who get infected have very mild um, disease, that is no shortness of breath, maybe a little cough or sore throat or no symptoms. The remaining 20% are broken down into severe and critical. These are the people that generally present to the hospital with shortness of breath. So that's about two thirds to three quarters and then about maybe 20 to 30 percent are, are the people that end up going onto mechanical ventilation or have shock end up in the ICU. Okay, so this is held up pretty well. I'm not really going to talk much about the case fatality rate. It's all over the place. It really depends on the part of the world, the city, the, the, the cohort of patients. Um, you know, it's probably somewhere in the 1.5 to 3 percent range. However, the true infection fatality rate, that is, if you look at the total number of people infected, um, once we figure that out, we'll probably be a lot lower. It'll probably be something more in the order of 0.3 to 0.5 percent. However, remember that's that's three to five times at least the infection mortality rate with or fatality rate with flu. So it is, it is more um, serious than influenza in that regard. This is a JAMA graph that I like. It, it summarizes um, essentially the um, sort of the chronology of this disease in terms of testing which is really important. So if you look at over here, and I think I've got a little arrow here, yeah, you can see that the light blue and the purple um, are the PCR um, evolution here. And you see PCR in the nose um, or RNA starts to pick up uh, in the week before patients present, before they have symptoms. And you know that's why we now say that if somebody is diagnosed with COVID, they may have been contagious for one to two days prior to that because you can start to detect virus and then the viral goes up, but then it starts to go down at around week two to three. The antibodies, um, both IgM and Ig come later, like all infectious diseases, they tend to start to, to come out at around seven to 10 days and they peak at about three weeks. And this is why doing antibodies in the first seven to 10 days is not very useful. They tend to be negative, but if you go out to three to four weeks, you have a much greater chance of, of getting a positive, whether it's IgM or IgG. Another point I'd like to make is there will be some patients, particularly patients that are very sick with uh, lower respiratory tract infection, i.e. pneumonia, who will have a negative nasal PCR, but may have a positive PCR on either sputum or endotracheal secretions or BAL. Sometimes the virus is primarily in the lungs and not in the nasal pharynx. That's something to keep in mind. Um, a lot of people are asking about serologies. I'm not a big fan yet. Um, but they're out there. You can get them through um, LabCorp that provides the Abbott serology. There's a bunch of others. They're generally pretty sensitive, but only if you, if you, if you wait long enough. If you, if you do your serology at seven to 10 days, they're not very sensitive, maybe 60%, but out at three to four weeks, they're somewhere in the 90 to 100% range. Perhaps more importantly is the specificity. The specificity with the best test now is 99% um, percent plus, and that's important because if you're just 99% or below 99%, um, your pre and your pretest probability is moderate. Your post-test probability or likelihood ratio is not very good. You'll actually have more false positives than true positives. So you really need a specificity 
that's above 99%. And that does appear to be the case um, with these. But the other thing to remember is, even if you have a positive antibody, it doesn't guarantee um, protection against reinfection. We still don't know for sure what the correlate is of protection. So please don't tell your patients that this is a great test to get because if you're positive, then you're out of the woods. We don't know that. And it's possible that people might get reinfected. Okay, I thought something that's quite new is the concept of the rapid antigen COVID tests. So in the inimitable um, words of uh, the great Paul Sachs of the Brigham in his HIV and ID observations, this by the way is a great site. It's sort of like a blog. He does it every week. He summarizes HIV and ID literature with a real great sense of humor. He makes the following comments. These tests will be cheap, about one to five dollars a go, uh, about the cup of a price of a cup of coffee. They can be done on saliva, no brain biopsy required, ha ha. They can be done frequently if need be. They can be done every day for college students or healthcare workers. And they, they may answer the key question, am I contagious to others right now? And this point being that even though their sensitivity is typically on the 60 to 80% range, um, if, you're, if, if it's negative, it's probably less likely that you're contagious. And so in fact, there is the, the first rapid test is now available. It's been, it's received an emergency use authorization by the FDA. It's the Quidel Sophia SARS antigen FIA. The company quotes a sensitivity of 100% and a specificity of 80%. I have not actually been able to see the raw data. So I would take that with a grain of salt. I would be uh, happy if the sensitivity is more in the order, even if it's just 70, 80%. Um, and I would certainly hope that the specificity is a little bit higher, but we'll see. Um, you know, in terms of, of the utility of these, this is an example of one that's um, been licensed by a Harvard Institute and is being developed by the Sherlock Biosciences Group. And you can see it's a handheld uh, cartridge. You, you, put, you put your blood right here and you, you wait 15 minutes and pull it out and get your answer. This really could be very easy to use. Very, it could be transformative because it could be done at the point of care. It could be done at home. And I think uh, Paul Sachs's point that it doesn't have to be as good as PCR to be useful. In fact, there's one study out there right now that suggests that testing, um, the frequency of testing is actually, that actually trumps in terms of importance, the accuracy or, or the sensitivity testing. So I think we're going to see more about this as these start to come out. So turning to the uh, sort of uh, just the basic clinical aspects, what are some clues to the diagnosis? And you're all going to see this disease. It's a really interesting disease. So the hallmark is unexplained hypoxemia, which of course is very nonspecific. But these patients, it's interesting, they tend to have lymphopenia. And actually lymphopenia and the ratio with platelets is actually a prognostic sign. Many of them have transaminitis, so it is a systemic disease. And interestingly, they usually present with a normal procalcitonin. And that's why we don't need to give these patients antibiotics for community-acquired pneumonia when they first hit the door if there's no evidence that they have a bacterial pneumonia, i.e. the procalcitonin is normal, they don't have purulent sputum, et cetera. What we do find, however, is that they tend to have elevated um, acute phase reactants and markers of inflammation. The CRP can be very high, LDH, ferritin, and D-dimer. Now, D-dimer is, is, is more a marker of, of hypercoagulation, um, and, and this is something that's seen. But these all tend to go up, and the higher they go up, generally the poorer these patients do. The chest x-ray tends to be uh, quite suggestive, and particularly the CT scan. You, you tend to see these peripheral ground glass opacities mixed in with some peripheral areas of consolidation. I've seen hundreds of these, hundreds of these now, and, and there's, a, there's a variety of different presentations, but they all have that sort of COVID-ish uh, look to them. Um, we don't recommend routinely getting CT scans because generally they're not necessary to make the diagnosis of pneumonia, the chest x-ray suffices, and we don't want to unnecessarily expose our radiologists and radiology staff to people with this disease. What are the complications? Well, I think everybody's heard of adult respiratory distress syndrome, but some of these patients get septic shock, they get myocardial involvement, hypercoagulability with pulmonary emboli is thought to be an important cause of death. Many get acute kidney injury. We do see cytokine storm and the uh, hemophagocytic lymphohistocytosis syndrome. There have been reports of more ischemic strokes, um, various neurologic uh, manifestations, including encephalopathy, there's dermatologic manifestations ranging from COVID toes seen and purplish toes seen in children to petechiae. And then there is this emerging syndrome of the post-COVID syndrome. Um, I show this, this is taken from a clinical trial that's being done at Tulane. It's an immunomodulator study 
for patients with a so-called cytokine storm. And I simply show it to highlight what, are, what some of the criteria are for the definition of the cytokine storm. In this particular study, it's a very high ferritin, a high CRP, a high D dimer, and a high LDH. The problem is there is no consensus on the definition of the cytokine storm. Every study that I've seen has slightly different thresholds. It's probably a continuum. Um, there's even some that argue that it's really not a true cytokine storm. I think the jury's still out. I think we still don't know precisely how to how to stage this disease. And that's gonna probably be very important if we're gonna get the treatment right. But keep in mind that, that, this, uh, that there are different definitions for cytokine storm. Um, this is the um, article published in JAMA a couple of weeks ago from a group in Italy, looking at the first really published look at the post-COVID syndrome. And what you see here is that um, in um, um, uh, this, uh, this group of patients, about two months after the onset of their first symptoms, um, what, about 50% actually still had fatigue. And then a little over 40% had shortness of breath, followed by joint pain, chest pain, and some had cough. And actually, um, only about 13% were free of uh, any COVID symptoms. So 87% had one, two, or three of these symptoms. And you can see that the symptoms are a little bit different from acute COVID, where there's more cough. Cough was predominant along with fatigue, whereas with this, it's more the fatigue and shortness of breath. And this is something that's being studied. We don't know a lot about it. We don't think it's ongoing due to ongoing viral replication. We think it's due to um, um, you know, structural damage, immunologic uh, manifestations, inflammatory manifestations, et cetera. But this is something that you will see and it's something that we need to study to better understand. Um, just touch briefly on predictors of mortality. This is some data from the UK published in BMJ, which I think shows very nicely in this forest plot the sort of dose dependent effect with increasing age. As age goes up, the hazard ratio goes up significantly. You can see that female sex is actually protective. Men are more likely to die. And then all the chronic comorbidities, be it cardiac disease, pulmonary, kidney, diabetes, obesity, neurologic disease, cancer, and liver disease, all, all uh, have increased hazard uh, ratios. Um, and, and there's still a lot of work looking at how to tease all these out. You know, For instance, hypertension is, is very high in these cohorts, but what it, whether or not it's an independent risk factor is not entirely clear. We should be very uh, cognizant of the fact that this epidemic has sort of uh, revealed the, the ugly underbelly of American society in terms of racism and uh, social and health inequities and disparities. And what you see here in this data from New York City, whether you look at cases per 100,000, hospitalizations or deaths, African-Americans and Hispanic Latinos are overrepresented in cases, hospitalization, and deaths. So they're clearly, um, these minorities are being disproportionately affected, and this has to do with uh, social determinants of health, uh, comorbidities, um, you know, all the different things that probably play into this, and this is still being unraveled. Um, this is a one of the early, actually probably the first diagram um, of uh, somebody's conception of the stages of COVID. It's, it is a model, it's not perfect. I'm sure it will be tweaked, but I like it. And basically what it shows is that this disease starts out as a viral disease early on with high viral load, and then it transitions into more of a, a hyper inflammatory disease where you start getting pulmonary symptoms and then you get things like ARDS, um, shock, et cetera, which are probably due to hyperinflammation. It will be very important to nail this down because this will probably have significant implications for when to give our various interventions. And I, I think, you know, the way I look at this is the treatment for this will ultimately probably be an antiviral for the early phase and an immunomodulator for the middle and later phases and possibly both either combined or given sequentially, okay? So this down here is, is an early depiction. I don't think it's very accurate. Remdesivir probably doesn't work very well after the first seven to 10 days, um, whereas immunomodulators may work better later. But this all still has to be worked out. And this is just a nice way of, of kind of, of, a way of kind of getting your, your arms around this uh, complicated disease. Um, there are many different antivirals that are being explored around the world, dozens, and there are many immunomodulators that are being looked at. I'm not going to get into the weeds here for every one of these. Um, but the, the first one to receive emergency use approval here in the U.S. Uh, is remdesivir. Um, and this is the NIAID Act 1 study that was published in the New England Journal. 
uh, looking at over a thousand patients. And what you see is that the median recovery time was shortened by about four days from placebo compared with placebo in the remdesivir arm. This did reach statistical significance with a hazard ratio of 1.32. So pretty significant shortening of recovery time. However, disappointingly, the decrease in mortality by day 14 from 12% to 7%, while maybe a trend was not statistically significant. You can see the confidence interval crossed one. I think what it probably comes down to is it, again, like I said before, it depends on which patients you treat. And it looks like the patients in this particular category, they had a scoring category that uh, had to do with severity. And the score five group was the group that was getting oxygen. Not the patients that were on room air and not the patients that were on BiPAP or intubated. The patients just on oxygen seemed to have the best um, hazard ratio in terms of benefit and uh, you know, a significant confidence interval. So we, we generally use it for people on oxygen or, or, or intubation, but this may be the group that will benefit um, the most. What about immune modulators? This obviously is gonna be key because this is in, in large part an immunologic disease that damages the lungs and other organs. And so a, a, the first drug that actually, actually has been shown to reduce mortality is dexamethasone. And this is the um, New England Journal uh, publication from last Friday. I mean, there's a re preliminary report from the recovery group uh, in the United Kingdom. And to summarize the tables here, what you see is that in this um, uh, graph, you can see that in all participants, there was about a 17% reduction in mortality, but the greatest benefit was in those who were mechanically ventilated. So the risk reduction here was about 36% with dexamethasone. In those who were not, were only on oxygen, but not on ventilators, the risk reduction was more modest at 18%. And actually, there was an increased risk of mortality in those without oxygen, although it did not reach statistical significance. This is a forest plot that simply shows you the same thing. So overall, patient, all patients benefited, but those who were on oxygen only benefited the most. So this would suggest that you know, the timing of, of giving this is probably very important. The other drug that's been batted around a lot is tocilizumab. It is FDA approved for autoimmune diseases. It's very expensive. Um, it may be in short supply, but there's been a number of publications. This is the most recent from a few weeks ago in CID. It was an observational study, mind you, not a randomized controlled trial. These patients had abnormal imaging. They had rapidly worse gas exchange. They did not have evidence of other infections. And there was a high clinical suspicion of the cytokine release or cytokine storm, i.e. with very high ferritin D-dimer. So one would expect that these would be the people that might benefit the most from this drug, which is an anti-IL-6 um, agent, and IL-6 levels are very high in these kinds of patients. And what they found was in this particular survival plot here, you can see that out of 50 days, there was a significant uh, survival uh, benefit in those who received tocilizumab versus those who were untreated. Um, this is a, a nice colorful diagram showing the treated group and the untreated group. And what you see here is that um, there were um, more patients were discharged in the green. However, um, they did see uh, more in the orange, more patients develop super infections. Now they, they point out that despite the increased super infections such as pneumonia, the overall mortality was lower, but this is something that we need to be very vigilant about because we may, what we may do here is we may push the mortality and the morbidity out further out. We may get people over the hump of the initial disease with its immunologic damage, but then we may start to see problems down, uh, for further out. So we need to be looking out for things like invasive aspergillosis in these kinds of patients. This is a treatment pathway I came up with recently, and it simply uh, says that if you have severe COVID, i.e. your O2 sats less than or equal to 94% of your own oxygen, you should be considered for remdesivir plus or minus dexamethasone. Um, we recommend proning, particularly for intubated patients. It may be of some benefit in those who are not intubated. Anticoagulation is very critical uh, because this disease does kill, we think, through microthrombi and pulmonary emboli. And so um, aggressive anticoagulation is, is critical. This is a wonderful um, set of recommendations that Dr. Cindy Lessinger, chief of HEMOC, has put together based on um, national and international guidelines. She has reviewed this recently. It is still up to date. It is posted on the TMC internet. Um, she did uh, warn me that there are studies out there that may, uh, would, that the results of which may end up changing some of these recommendations, but you have a low threshold to go to therapeutic anticoagulation. 
Um, this is from the SIDRAP group at the University of Minnesota. Um, Mike Osterholm is one of the well-known ID epidemiologists who's part of the group, and also John Barry, the author from the Tulane School of Public Health, published this article, which is a basically model for how this disease will play out over the next year and a half or two years. And the potential models are sort of um, similar peaks and valleys, perhaps a fall peak, maybe that's what we're in right now with some improvement, or the slow burn where this is the spring and then we have a series of smaller and smaller peaks. Um, we really don't know which this way this is gonna go, but I will say that Carlos Del Rio at Emory uh, shared this uh, graph from the 1918 epidemic, uh, flu epidemic uh, in Denver, showing that when after interventions they peaked and then they, their, their peak came down, but then the interventions were removed akin to what's happened in the US and they had a, a worse surge after that. I hope that's not the case, but I think that's what's happening right now. So really, the, 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 when, it, when it comes to long-term projections, the principles are that the population has no prior immunity, or humans have not seen this virus before, and the end game, we think, is that we need to achieve herd immunity, which means that, um, that somewhere in the order of 55 to 70 percent of people will need to become infected or vaccinated uh, with an effective vaccine for this uh, epidemic to burn out. And so this leads us to the so-called concept of flattening the curve. The idea here is if we can use mitigation measures to get the daily number of cases down, what happens is you basically blunt the, the peak, you spread it out. You may still have the same number of cases all told, but you delay the cases and you keep the number of cases, the daily cases within a manageable number so that hospitals can provide good care so that we don't run out of drugs. So basically mitigation is to prevent overwhelming the hospitals, but it also buys us time so that if we can delay this until next year, we may have new treatments that are more effective and we may have effective vaccines. And the good news is that there are a record number of vaccines already. This is a nice website you can go to, just Google uh, WHO COVID vaccine, and this is updated every couple of days. This is the status as of early this week. There are now 24 candidate vaccines in clinical uh, development and uh, overall almost 150 candidate vaccines in preclinical evaluation. This is a, a nice review of the vaccines in JAMA. Um, there's a so-called Operation Warp Speed um, which is this initiative to uh, help uh, various companies develop their vaccines, and these are five of of the top 10 contenders. You can see Moderna and Pfizer have messenger RNA vaccines. Um, the other one that's been in the news recently is the University of Oxford, AstraZeneca, that's a replication defective um, adenovirus, and there are a number of others. So the last week, uh, last 10 days, actually, there has been a, a surfeit of um, publications on vaccines. It's very exciting. So this is the one that was published in the New England Journal. We already had seen preliminary data but this was actually published, and this is the Moderna um, NIAID study of a messenger RNA vaccine. This is a lipid nanoparticle encapsulated messenger RNA based vaccine that encodes for a full length spike uh, protein. It was given to 45 uh, people in the, this is the phase one study, and we'll do this quickly, but what you can see here is that these are the reciprocal endpoint titers or, G, or GMT that's, uh, geometric mean titers. This is uh, antibody to the spike protein, to the receptor binding domain. And then you have the neutralization assay here, uh, assays that show that these were largely neutralizing antibodies. The good news is that virtually everybody, particularly after the second dose, um, achieved uh, robust uh, antibody responses with neutralizing antibodies. And so uh, uh, you know, one of the conclusions is that the, there was roughly about two, two times the uh, concentration or level of vaccine seen with a natural infection. And so this certainly uh, bodes well, but I, warn, I caution you, the caveat being that we don't know for sure what the correlates of immunity are. We don't know for sure if this equals protection against reinfection. There were quite a few adverse events, um, both with the first dose, but even more so with the second dose, a lot of pain the injection site, fatigue, you can see lots of fever um, with the second dose. These vaccines will have side effects. There's no getting around that. And all the vaccine studies seem to have um, similar reports of adverse events. This is the other uh, big study that just got published in Lancet earlier this week. This is the Oxford COVID vaccine. This is a different uh, method. This is a um, uh, basically a replication deficient simian 
the adenovirus that contains the full length structural surface uh, S spike protein of the virus. So this is almost like a Trojan horse. It gets the virus, it has a virus that infects the human and then uh, gets in and then exposes uh, the immune system to this. Um, and their data also looks similarly very promising. They used a meningococcal vaccine as a control, and this is days in the x-axis after vaccination. You can say at baseline, low levels. After the initial priming um, dose, you can see significant, and this is a logarithmic scale, significant increases in antibodies um, to the surface protein. And then with the prime boost, that's a second dose, you get even higher median levels. And this compares very favorably um, with 180 convalescent um, patient samples in, in terms of numbers. So this, this looks very, very promising. The other thing that's actually important is remember, not all immunity is due to humoral response or antibodies. We believe that the cell median immune system also plays a role. We're not quite sure how much of a role it plays in this disease, but they also looked at the interferon gamma response through LE spot testing. And this looks at the, um, at the cell median immune system. And again, you see comparing with the meningococcal vaccine, you can see that both of the prime and the prime boost, you get um, significantly logarithmically increased levels of um, spot forming cells, which means that there's good interferon gamma production, which bodes well for the possibility that this is also engendering a cell median immune response. China Dave, also are you just about done? Because uh, let's see. We're at time. Yeah, almost done. I'm going to move through here. China's vaccine is very similar uh, with good antibody levels. Um, the Pfizer antibody is very good. Uh, that mRNA vaccine is very good. The modeling would suggest that we ideally need a vaccine that's at least 80% effective that achieves 75% vaccine coverage. Okay, that's a tall order, but it's very doable. Um, I will send out the slides, but the bottom line is that mass work. Um, and there's a couple of studies here, including these women that uh, had their hair done with uh, two hairdressers that were infected and none of them got infected um, despite not wearing N95s. They're all wearing regular masks. And I'm gonna skip through these slides. I'm gonna give you these useful publications. This is my survival kit. I strongly recommend you sign up for this COVID-19 Daily Digest where uh, Clay uh, Christian does a great job of summarizing um, all of the daily literature. And with that, my favorite quote, I'll turn this over to my colleague, uh, Dr. Fusco. Darlene? I have to wait for you to unshare the screen. Ah, okay. Thanks, all right, let's see if I can share my screen, share. And then we'll go to here. There we go. And we'll go here. Hi. Okay. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes, we can. Okay, super. So thanks, Steve. So I just want to present some disclosures. Um, I'm the PI of uh, two Gilead studies and uh, three regener uh, four Regeneron studies and have received funding in the past from Gilead. And we'll be talking here a little bit about anti-SARS-CoV-2 countermeasures measures that are under study and have not yet been proven to be effective. Um, we'll talk about some highlights of some clinical trials and then a deeper dive into one observational study. Um, as Dave alluded, uh, there are a lot of clinical trials that are either uh, recently closed or ongoing at Tulane. Um, we are trying to keep an updated list of who's enrolling and what the inclusion and exclusion criteria are. And we are asking everyone to please think about which studies have uh, value um, and, and, and talk about them because this is kind of a, a, a necessary group effort that we go through the pros and cons of every single study together. It's a massive amount of information. So, you know, from, from technicians to medical students all the way up to senior attendings, we, we are interested in everyone's opinions. Um, I'm going to provide a little bit more detail on one particular study. So I'm focusing on advertising one, but remember there are many. So again, please make sure to try to learn about all of them. This is kind of a new concept. So I wanted to go into a little bit of detail about it. The next several slides were provided by Regeneron, the company making this one, okay? Um, so they basically have this proprietary technology and expertise that they have uh, been developing for the past 30 years. 
the, the bottom line is it is to try to make antibodies quickly against a target pathogen. Um, they call it the Velocimmune uh, Unique Technology Suite, and it links to this thing called Velocimab, but basically they immunize or they find sick people who have been sort of self-immunized, and then they isolate antibodies, and then they upscale to do mass production of those antibodies. And so they, they are stating it's unprecedented speed from immunization to a GMP production at cell lines. And then the final molecules get chosen from over a thousand antibodies, and they have really uh, put their whole group onto COVID since January. Um, this group has worked on MERS before, uh, and use that same platform to identify and validate spike protein blocking antibodies and have done phase one studies for, for MERS. For Ebola virus, they did well. And uh, in a major randomized clinical trial in DRC, it looks like there's a mortality prevention and they have an FDA review underway for that with the decision hopefully to come out this fall, which we should keep our eyes on. And then for SARS-CoV-2, they looked initially for hundreds of potent antibodies and then uh, have selected just a few to focus on developing a countermeasure or therapeutic. Um, and so basically they've taken this technology to try to compress the time it takes to find antibodies that are good and could be directly infused uh, down to less than six months. And again, the prior experience has been in Ebola and MERS and now they're on the SARS-CoV-2. So this January, they began this coronavirus discovery program. And basically, where are we now? They just uh, initiated the clinical trials of Regeneron CoV-2 antibodies, and they're trying to do mass production so that this is a largely available countermeasure by this August. Um, so just a little bit of general information on this concept. So this would be passive immunity. This would be us giving preformed antibodies to people. Um, so this is immunity gained during your lifetime. It's called, I'm sorry, immunity gained during your lifetime is called adaptive immunity. There's passive and there's active. Both use antibodies. This passive immunity comes when you receive antiviral antibodies directly from an injection and infusion transfer. Okay, delivering passive Im immunity has been established. Um, there was a Nobel Prize back in 1901 for passive immunity of, uh, against diphtheria from diphtheria survivors infused directly into patients. Um, and then the most recent innovation has been for Ebola and just before that, I think most of you have heard of the, the anti-RSV antibody that we give to uh, particularly preterm pre infants. Um, so this is not a vaccine that we're talking about. This is a direct passive transfusion of antibody. So there are differences. We do want to get ourselves into vaccine trials. You know, we, we are positioned to, to be in those. We, we did not get Moderna. We need to get vaccine trials here. We need to know if they work in our population. And, and like Dr. Mushat uh, mentioned, we need to follow what's going on with the vaccine literature. So we're, we're ready to distribute whichever is the best candidate uh, right away. And, uh, but this is a different concept. This is passive immunity. And so they look for virus neutralizing antibodies uh, from recovered patients and genetically humanized animals. In this particular case, they've used a combo, one from humans, one from a mouse model, and then they humanize them. And then uh, they, first they clone them, and then they, they grow them in large quantities in bioreactors, and then they purify, concentrate, and package it into a treatment form. So this can then be a prevention or a treatment. And this immunity is there immediately. We infuse it and the antibodies are there. The downside is this will probably not last long, only a few months at best guess, okay? Whereas a vaccine should be longer lasting. So this idea is not to replace a vaccine. It is to buy us some time while we're waiting for that good vaccine. Um, and then the principle of it, if successful, could be applied to other viruses as they emerge. So it's important to figure out. So, how do antibodies work against SARS-CoV-2? Well, SARS comes in with its spike and binds to the receptors and gets inside. If we use some antibodies to block that spike, the entry process, the earliest step of the virus getting in should be blocked. Um, what if the antibody site, uh, binding site were to mutate away? Well, that's why they use a cocktail approach to diminish this risk of viral escape. Um, so multiple antibodies that might bind to non-competitive location 
uh, would require the virus to escape through multiple different mutations, which we say is highly unlikely. Keep in mind that here at Tulane, we're looking at the mutations. Um, there are various labs looking at the, the sequences as they emerge. So Dr. Gary's group and uh, Eric DeMontoy and Claudia Herrera are all looking uh, very actively at what are the sequences circulating in our population. Um, so there is the precedent for this in this Ebola cocktail. That one happens to have three antibodies. The one for SARS-CoV-2 will have two. So the program they're proposing is a treatment for hospitalized patients, treatment for outpatients and prevention. And so we actually just opened yesterday for this trial uh, and we'll call it 2066. That's the inpatient antibody infusion. It'll be here and at UMC. The goal is safety, tolerability, efficacy of the anti-spike SARS-CoV-2 monoclonal antibodies, randomized, placebo-controlled. So it's a one-to-one-to-one, -to -one -to -one, low dose, high dose placebo. And this is basically what would happen to a patient who's enrolled. Uh, it's a very brisk enrollment, so it really shouldn't compete terribly with other studies. Uh, this patient would come in and has to have only had symptoms for seven days and has to have been hospitalized within 72 hours. So they're in their first seven days of symptoms. They're in their first three days of hospitalization. They have to have an oxygen requirement to maintain O2 sat above 93% room air. They can be nasal cannula high flow or intubated. And their positive PCR has to be within 72 hours. So basically these are patients who got sick within seven days, tested and hospitalized within three days. So these are the patients who have just walked in the door. They're excluded if their O2 is greater than 94% of room air, if they're not expected to survive 48 hours, if they're on ECMO, new stroke, or seizure, if they're on renal replacement therapy due to COVID, if they've gotten convalescent plasma. So convalescent plasma in this study compete directly, which makes sense because these are two antibody studies. Um, this is a randomized controlled trial with a, a targeted antibody. Convalescent plasma is open label uh, with open plasma. We don't know, it, it's a mix of antibodies. Um, they cannot have participated in a clinical research study within 30 days or five half-lives of a drug. They can't be breastfeeding and they cannot uh, be unwilling to practice safe contraception for six months from the last dose. So study procedures, basically it is a one infusion study. They get one dose and then they get a lot of swabs and a medium number of blood draws. So one dose and then every number is a, is a nasopharyngeal swab. So 1, 3, 5, 7, 9, 11, 13, 15, 22, and 29. So basically every other day swabs and then uh, weekly. And they get blood draws every other day and then weekly. Uh, they, can be, they can be discharged without interrupting the study. There is actually a home health service that will go to their homes or we'll see them in clinic to complete the uh, later blood draws and swabs. So this is kind of a swab heavy study. I'll point out that this study is sponsored by BARDA and it's working with Viracor. So they're really trying to do two things at once, figure out whether this antibody uh, works and also when they're trying to characterize uh, virus shedding with a lot of detail. We're also gonna be enrolling for 67 and 69. 2067 is the same thing basically, but they're outpatients. So people who are sick, who are early in their course, they come into the clinic, we infuse them, and then they are followed with swabs and blood draws uh, for, for several weeks. Household contacts have to have been in the home for more than eight hours a day with someone who is now sick. And we will, uh, and then they anticipate to continue living with that person for at least the next month. So we don't have a vaccine to offer today, but we now have something that, that is, it's uh, our site initiation visit is Monday. We should be open by Tuesday. Uh, we should be able to offer this to household contacts of sick people. This is a trial, so it's placebo control. Uh, I just wanna make sure that's really clear. This is a, this is a randomized controlled trial. And um, if this works, then obviously things will hopefully convert to open label and we could provide this as a countermeasure. But this is a trial, we need answers, we need something that we can give and, and hopefully we'll be able to enroll and, and sort this out. I just wanna point out that these clinical trials take a massive amount of work and this is our really dedicated staff. They have been working seven days a week uh, since the first cases of COVID. Um, so we, we need to thank them and we need to really support them. Um, I know I'm really running short on time, but I do wanna point out 
one other thing, this observational study that the CDC is now funding. So, so the CDC is checking in with us weekly regarding how we're doing at Tulane, um, trying to figure out uh, what is the immune response to SARS-CoV-2 in the Louisiana population and um, what are any risk factors that make our patients potentially do worse. We're trying to provide them with a detailed description of clinical virus and immune antibody and cytokine response. And um, you know, we've been infamous for some really bad virus hotspots and we do need to sort out why that is. And Dave discussed that a lot already. And so the results that are expected by the government on this grant are try to find why we have such a high mortality in certain regions and then uh, how long and where are people shedding virus? And that's in a partnership with the Non-Human Primate Center, as well as with the CRISPR team, Tony Hu and Boning. So Jay and Brandon are helping us sort out uh, whether the virus that we detect is live, and then Tony and Bo, um, whether CRISPR is able to predict uh, where virus will be shed, and then Bob is helping with the, the PCR and the sequencing. Um, one question is, you know, are, are people who are swab negative maybe shedding in their stool? Is there, is, are we accurately assessing when infectivity has ended with a nasal pharyngeal swab alone? We're looking at the immune response uh, using two different antibody platforms, one from James Robinson and one from Bob Gary and his company. And we, we have a very large team uh, helping to identify and recruit patients, helping to assess the clinical response assess the immune response, including both antibody and cytokines, and then also looking at virus shedding in terms of sequence, uh, live versus dead, high sensitivity detection, and uh, conventional qPCR methods that work. Uh, as of last week, we had 118 subjects enrolled, uh, and basically we have an average age of about 60. Just thinking, you know what? You guys have seen some of this data before, but I just want to put out one little bit of good news. Um, you know, when this came on, I know we're entering our second wave now. We all expected this to happen. Okay, this is not a surprise. We're much better prepared than before. Um, but we do need to point out some of the good things. Turnaround time for tests got faster very quickly at Tulane. This is our, our in-house test combined with our commercial tests. This is thanks to our pathology department working with our research groups. Uh, there was massive uh, effort on this. Our date of symptom onset versus time to first swab, how quickly those patients got in, improved dramatically over the first month. So our population is trying hard to get tested faster. Um, our sequences don't show anything crazy dramatic in terms of massive numbers of exotic introductions. Um, and, and we're on target to, to understand this better because now we're, we're getting a comprehensive description of virus shedding and antibody production. Um, we do hope that the work in this observational study is going to lay groundwork for surveillance implementation and vaccine and therapeutic antibody assessment. So, so these studies talk to each other. So I just wanted to put a thank you out to all the people who've been working on this observational study and also all the work in general. We've had enormous support from the CDC, from the medical school, from HCA, from UMC, from the CTU, the IRB, tons of medical students, pharmacists, technicians, undergrads, researchers who are working around the clock on this, and then our patients and their families. And I know there are a lot of questions, so I'm going to stop there. I want to thank both Dr. Mushat and Dr. Fusco for taking the time from their busy schedule for this excellent presentation. Also, we all, both of them, our uh, gratitude for their tireless work in helping us uh, coping uh, with this pandemic. Uh, I also uh, note that Dr. Mushat has been kind enough to answer a lot of questions online. We have a few minutes uh, to answer any additional questions if there are some. I'll uh, pause a moment and uh, wait. Uh, you can uh, type the question in the Q&A box. It seems like uh, there are no additional questions. Once again, thank you both uh, very much for this excellent presentation. We appreciate that. Thank you all for joining. Bye.